the real version and the right word is I quit. I just stopped. I gave up. And I said, that will never happen in my life, no matter what. Because there's one thing in life that you can control, right? And that is how hard you compete. On today's episode, we sit down with former collegiate All-American and Penn State Hall of Fame wrestler, Chris Bevilacqua. Chris shares his inspiring story of overcoming a career-ending injury when preparing for the Olympics, but applying those lessons from his competitive sports background into launching successful business ventures like college sports television. Influenced by his parents' strong moral code and a wrestling match he will never forget, Chris navigates the business landscape with extreme determination and grit. Chris offers his valuable insights on resilience, competition, and the power of perseverance in life. Tune in to hear how Chris transformed challenges into opportunities in the world of business. My voice in today's episode is powered by Eleven Labs. Our guest today is the epitome of an athlete who took the lessons of sports and applied them to life after sports with wild success. He ended his All-American Hall of Fame wrestling career at Penn State and set his eyes on the Olympics. But a severe arm injury ended his dream. Chris Bevlacqua, it's a pleasure and an honor to have you on our podcast. Likewise, the pleasure and honor is mine. Good to see you guys. Good to see you too. Chris, what happened? What was the arm injury? So I had a, uh, you know, when I was in, a senior in high school, no, actually a sophomore, I first heard it and it was one of those recurring uh, shoulder dislocation injuries that by the time I was a senior, I had to get my arm reconstructed. And back in those days, they didn't have like the kind of surgery that I have now. So that's literally, they had to cut my chest off, wrap it around, staple it in. I missed a, almost two years of competing, uh, ended up going to Penn State. And uh, I was a red-shirted freshman, and then I came back, and I wrestled for, I was able to wrestle for four years, and then in my senior year, believe it or not, as I, I was cross-training, I was boxing, and in one of these, like, boxing workouts, I tore my arm out, I pulled the whole staple out, and that was pretty much the end of my wrestling career, because I had to go in after the NCAs that year and get it re-reconstructed. And, and, and again, it was, they cut the whole thing open, they go in, they tie it up and they screwed it in. And it was, that was the end of my wrestling career. <laughs> so I had to figure out what to do with the rest of life when I was 23 and not prepared to do that at the time. I thought I was going to try to wrestle in the Olympics and didn't work out that way. A lot of, you hear about a lot of athletes who have like their whole mind made up and the, the path they're going to go. And then they experience, you know, a devastating injury like that. What's that? What was that first couple of days like, I guess, realizing that you're not, you know, you have to make a big life pivot? Um, you know, it's funny. I don't remember that being like a, a couple of day thing, right? I, I, I recall that being like a longer, more drawn out and ultimately thoughtful process where just gradually over time, you realize that, you know, I need to think about the rest of my life versus, you know, I'm going to compete and, and I'm going to take the next couple of years and I'm going to train to do this. And my goal in 1988, or it really was more 1992, the Barcelona, that, that's sort of where the whole thing was set up for me. And, and I knew once I came to the realization, and again, it took a little bit of time and it was probably during when I was rehabbing my arm and trying to figure out what was ahead of life. And then I just decided, well, that's not going to happen. And so what do I want to do with life? And, you know, one thing I was certain of was I just wanted to stay in the world of sports. Let's start back when you were a kid. Both of your parents were teachers and you were the oldest of six. Any brothers? How much pressure did you feel having to protect your siblings as the oldest? Um, another good question. You know, Tim thought about <laughs> this in some detail. Uh, you know, as the oldest of six, um, I, you know, we lived in a competitive family. Like, you know, we had six kids in eight years, three girls, three boys. They used to call us the bevy bunch. And <laughs> all my, all my uh, siblings were athletes and were doing their own thing. And, 
and you know, it was a little bit of, uh, of survival of the fittest, right? Everybody was trying to do their thing. And at that age, I was probably more self-interested, not necessarily, um, nurturing of my siblings in that way. It's turned out to be the opposite as I've gotten older and we've gotten much closer, but there was a lot of competitive, uh, I don't want to say competitive tension between me and my siblings because we all rooted for each other, but it always felt like it was all right. I was just trying to better myself. and I wasn't necessarily trying to, again, when I was in my teens, um, look at pulling everybody along with me. And, you know, my parents were teachers and educators and, you know, my, my mother in particular, right, was a disciplinarian and, you know, she was, she was treating everybody the same with, uh, with a big stick. <laughs> so it was, a, it was, there was a lot of discipline in my house. Your mom was the disciplinarian, not your dad? Oh yeah. She was, uh, as my father would say over the years, she was the head coach. He would say, <laughs> she's the head coach. I'm just the assistant coach. <laughs> what did your parents teach in school? Did you ever have them as the teachers of your class? Uh, well, you know, it's, it's interesting that you asked the question that way. Like, cause my father, and I can remember this many, many, many times over as I was in my childhood growing up, he was a teacher and an educator and he was a high school uh, phys ed, um, health and driver's ed teacher. And of course he ended up, uh, teaching many of the friends in the neighborhood. And he would always say when I would introduce him, like, Oh, my dad's a teacher. And he would always, he would always correct me. He'd always say, I'm not a teacher. I am an educator and I educate children on the subject of life. And that always like stuck with me because he was really serious about that. And he, and he thought his duty as a teacher went far beyond just teaching a specific class uh, or a classroom. It was more about how do I educate these young children or young adolescents on the subject of life and make them, you know, into a good person and that, that somebody that contributes back and does the right thing because it's the right thing to do. So I always remember that about mom and dad. And she was much the same way. And the block home and everybody was over my house. Mother was always, you know, making lunches for people. We had a pool in the backyard watching the life. Go. You know, it was just, it was just one of those, you know, classic upbringings that uh, I have great admiration for both my, my parents. Chris, can you describe your high school wrestling career and how you ended up at Penn state? Were you heavily recruited? Yeah. Um, my high school career was, kind of chopped up a little bit in that the fir we moved. So I mentioned earlier, my father was a well-known wrestling coach and educator on Long Island. And then he was also very actively involved in amateur wrestling at, at what ultimately became USA Wrestling. And he moved our family from New York to Stillwater, Oklahoma in 1979 when I was going into my junior year. And, you know, I, I had a really good sophomore year back on Long Island and I won the freestyle states and I was going to be one of the best guys, you know, in Long Island. And all of a sudden we're in a station wagon driving from New York to Stillwater, Oklahoma, because my father took a job at USA Wrestling. And he were he ultimately became well, the team leader of USA Wrestling, he was very involved in coaching. And, you know, that was the Olympic program that USA Wrestling put in place. Wow. So we were into all of that, and I spent two a year in Stillwater, Oklahoma, which is really the hotbed of, at the time, college wrestling was Oklahoma State. Stillwater is Oklahoma State. So here I was, me and my five brothers and sisters living in a foreign land with tumbleweeds and <laughs> looked a lot different than Long Island, and um, had, had a, a good year there, but then I got sick. I got mononucleosis, and that was the, the end of that. And then my father decided that, he didn't want to live in Oklahoma anymore. So we moved back. I spent my year, my senior year in, um, in, in back in Long Island. And that's when I hurt my shoulder. And, and that was when I got my first shoulder reconstruction. My, so my senior year didn't end well in terms of, I didn't win a state championship, which I know you did, Tim. Uh, and so 
I was a little bit disappointing. But then after I got my surgery, red shirted and got to Penn State, where I was recruited, but I was also recruited by a bunch of other schools, Oklahoma State. Um, obviously, I lived there. But they had a guy named Kenny Monday who ended up becoming a three-time NCAA champion and then an eventual Olympic champion. He was in my weight, so it's probably probably a good thing I didn't go there. Um, I got recruited by Michigan and Lehigh. And it came down to Michigan, Lehigh, and Princeton. And my father was like, I'll mortgage the house for you to go to Princeton. Uh, and I just said, when I, after I visited Penn State, like, this is where I want to be. And um, probably the, one of the best decisions I ever made. I'm glad I did it. What was it about Penn State that, that drew I, you? Uh, you know, I liked, you know, you just as these things go, like you, uh, it's really important. And I even think in today's day and age, like the coach is so important. Like, and, you know, Johnny Johnson was the head coach of Princeton at the time, who my dad knew well. And then you had, um, uh, uh, what's his name? Mark Lieberman was recruiting me. He was the NCAA champion from Lehigh. He wasn't the head coach. Thad Turner was, but also a good guy. But there was something about when I visited Penn State and I spent time with Coach Lorenzo and John Fritz, uh, where I just immediately connected with them. I liked them. And, you know, I liked the the fact that they were kind of in a rebuilding mode. And it was a great, Penn State was a great brand and a great institution. And they all were. I mean, I was, it was like a no-lose for me. Although in hindsight, as I've gotten older, I'm like, maybe I should have gotten that Ivy League degree. <laughs> so, but, it didn't, but not having it didn't get in the way. Uh, so it all worked out great. Did you study business at Penn State? How much did your degree help you in business after wrestling? Um, yeah, I studied business. I, I got a, a BS in marketing from, from Penn State. And they, you know, at the time... My father was, you know, he was always talking about not only was he a teacher, but like a lot of teachers, they, they always had these side jobs and side hustles. And, you know, he was a hard worker and I, I, was, I watched that. And so I always knew that I wanted to be in some kind of business. I just didn't know what. And, you know, the, the, the way the higher education system here in, you know, the U.S. works, right? I mean, as a as a an athlete, right? I always go back to, you know, we have the one of the greatest systems in the world, right? One of the the you know the best learning infrastructures and higher education apparatus combined with the ability to compete at elite level in college sports. There is no other uh, place in the world that offers that kind of opportunity. And you know, I thought that the, the totality of the experience of being a young adult away from home, getting a good education. Um, you know, I, I didn't get great grades. Uh, so, so that part, I probably, and some of it probably was due to lack of focus, you know, on my, on my studies, although I did enough to, you know, to, to learn and to learn how to, um, you know, get through critical thinking. And, and I can recall some really interesting classes I had along the way. But I, I wonder if the education I got at Penn State, um, you know, beyond what I was just describing as being the really, you know, the, where you grow from a young boy into a man, like those are the years that, that that happens and all the discipline that goes around, like getting yourself to class on time and paying attention and taking notes. And, you know, I, I probably didn't go to the next level um, or as, in hindsight, uh, in terms of the actual depth of the education. But I can say that the structure that came out of that and the, you know, the social relationships I formed and just understanding more broadly how business worked. And I took economics was kind of a, uh, a minor of mine and just learning, you know, supply and demand things and learning how the open market works. And like, I do recall, um, you know, those being really useful as I got into the business, but, but ultimately the things that I've, that have, I've done professionally to succeed in over time, right. Are, are things I think that a lot of that came instinctively and, and naturally on the one hand, on the other hand, you know, the, the old saying, the, the harder I work, the luckier I get. Right. And, you know, just, and, you know, there's, I try to teach my kids this. There's some certain lessons, life lessons that came out of all that, which 
I'm guessing Tim might have a question or two about this if he's done some research. <laughs> I know one of them's coming, so I'm not going to preempt that question. Describe your wrestling career. It must have been a dream come true when you were named an All-American. Where were you when you got the news? Was your dad able to get too many of your college matches? Oh, yeah. They, he got to pretty much all of them, which is <laughs> crazy to think that he's four and a half, five hours away and he's driving up. He's arriving 10 hours for a two-hour dual meet um, many, many, many times. Um, you know, I, uh, you know, the way you get All-America status is r- really right out of the NCAA tournament. So the first, I actually got named named freshman All-American, which is kind of a, a different type of an award because um, uh, they give that award out to you know, one, one freshman in every weight class every year. And I got that when I was a freshman, although I didn't place in the NCAs. And then when I was a sophomore, I placed in the NCAs, which makes you an automatic all American. I did similar in the, uh, in my junior year and my senior year is, you know, as I mentioned earlier is when I got hurt, even though I got hurt, my last match was in the, uh, was in the NCAs, uh, quarterfinals in, Iowa my senior year and my arm was hanging off by a thread and that was it. Was your dad, were you more excited or your dad more excited when you found out that you were an All-American? That's, uh, I would say definitely him. (laughs) And, uh, you know, it's like, I get asked similar questions, you know, over the years, like, and you know, like what, uh, someone was asking me recently, like, what do you want your, like your legacy to be? And I always think, it's kind of like, I don't, I didn't like, I competed, uh, like I can, comp- I was a wrestler because I loved to compete and I loved, I loved to win. And I, you know, all the preparation that goes in, in, in the one-on-one, the, the, the mano y mano, the combat, like there was just something about that, that really, uh, really jazzed me. And but I hated to lose more than I loved to win. And so I felt like, I feel like I look back on all this stuff and, and yeah, I was trying to win every single time and it became one of my true life lessons, but you don't win all the time, right? It's, you can't, I mean, unless you're Cal Sanderson and you win 158 times to no losses, like it's very rare that anybody just wins all the time. And so you know, I look back on that and you think, okay, well, what was really motivating me? Like I wanted to win every single time I was out there, but I wasn't, I mean, and I was disappointed obviously when I lost, but I, in, in the grand scheme, I think I won <laughs> so because I, I gave everything I had to it. And that's what being a competitive athlete is. Now, could you tell us about the wrestling match that changed your life? Oh yeah. Uh, I knew you were going to be prepared for that question. That's why I didn't preempt it before. Uh, so I, uh, I, it's the, it's the, one of the most important, it was the, the greatest lesson of my life. When I was a sophomore, uh, I was wrestling at the Meadowlands right here in New Jersey. And I was wrestling, uh, in the quarterfinals against a guy from North Dakota state called Mike Langlius. And Mike Langlius, who I had never heard of, uh, you know, was a, was a short, stocky guy with a mustache. I'll never forget this. And I still, even to this day, as I'm having this discussion with you, I can still remember it like it was yesterday. And I'm wrestling Mike, and I'm up by like 10 points in the first period and a half. It's like midway through the second period, and I'm like killing this guy. And, you know... I, I remember all the whistles and the sounds and the, the, the PA announcer and it's like a three ring circus and it's crowd noise, the whole thing as if I'm just sitting there right now. And, you know, a couple of things come to mind. He was, he was, he just kept on like diving at me and diving and you know, like and scrambling around. And, and I remember thinking to myself in this mess, like, holy cow, this guy's like, usually when you get ahead of someone like that, they just, they just kind of give up. And this guy kept diving. And, and at one point we were scrambling around and I, he rolled me over my ankle. I felt my ankle go pop and I was getting really tired. I got hurt and, you know, I'm trying to get through the, the match because this is going to put me into the semis and we get, 
we're going back and forth in the third period and i i end up you know long story short there i've already made a story long long story short there i lose the match like i could wrestle mike langley as 100 times and i would win 99 of them and on this particular day i lost that match and i walked off the mat i was like are you kidding me like I, and I remember being so angry and so embarrassed. And I, I walked underneath the, uh, you know, the stands and my coach came up to me and he's looking at me and I'm looking and I was just like, I, I was beside myself and I never felt that feeling before. And he's like, I, I, I looked him in the eye and I said, I don't, it's like, there's only one reason I lost that match. And that's never, ever going to happen to me ever again in my life in any way, shape or form. And it took me a while to like really get over that. But like when I had the honest assessment, the only reason I lost that match, and I always, I, I use the more fancy word, the elegant word was I got out competed. But the real version and the right word is I quit. I just stopped. I gave up. And I said, that will never happen in my life, no matter what, because there's one thing in life that you can control, right? And that is how hard you compete. Like if you never give up most of the time, not all the time, most of the time you're going to win. And like, I was never the greatest wrestler, but like, there's no way you could outcompete me. You could tie me, but you can't outcompete me. And ultimately, you may be better and you may win, but it's not going to be because I gave up ever. And that was the lesson. That was the life lesson. Uh, and it's funny, I tell this whole story. So I had this company here in New York, uh, uh, tech company. I got 100 people here, and they've heard me tell this story. We're building a tech business and we're competing against all the giants. And so I tell these, you know, these types of stories and I kind of, you know, refer back to things in my life. And this is the seminal moment. And so they've heard the Mike Langley story. So one day that for my 60th birthday last year, they're having a, they're, they do a party for me. And, but I'm here in the office and they put on this big screen and they said, we have a special guest to come to your party. And Mike Langlius, I met one time in my life for seven minutes. I never met him after that. And all of a sudden, the, 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 the Zoom window opens up, and I'm like, holy shit, it's Mike Langlius. <laughs> and I'm like, I can't believe you guys did this. And so we had a nice conversation. I looked at him, I said, Mike, you changed my life. I want you to know that because it's true. He changed my life, and I call it the gift that keeps on giving. I tell my children that i tell my employees that because if you just don't give up if, if that's the one lesson in life i could give you is don't give up you are going to win most of the time whatever that is so that's my story that's awesome what's mike doing now i'm just curious did he end up mike uh you know like over the years when i tell the story uh, i won't even tell the background i'll just start by saying does anybody know who mike langlius is and uh they're like no i go He's a land, he owns a landscaping business in Minnesota. And everybody's like, what the hell are you talking about? I go, that guy changed my life. And then I go back that's into awesome. the story. So that's what he does. He owns a landscaping business up in Minnesota. That's great. Does he remember the match with oh, as yeah. much uh, importance yes. as you did? He does. He remembered it. Yep. Now, he didn't know that the result of it was what I was describing. Sure, but, sure. yeah, yeah. Uh, but it truly is the gift that keeps on giving. I was thinking for him, it's the exact opposite, right? It's like I was, he probably tells the story and says, I was getting my ass kicked. I was down 10, nothing or whatever. I was down 10 points and I just kept shooting. You know, it's, yeah. it's probably a funny uh, perspective. He came back. Yeah. He, he's probably saying, oh, I made him quit and he'd be right. When and how did you first become interested in wrestling? Was it going to your dad's practices or maybe running the clock at a weekend wrestling meet for him? Kind of. Uh, both actually. Um, I didn't start wrestling until I was in ninth grade and he would take me up to his practices just because he, you know, my mother needed to run errands and he needed to watch us. So I'd 
sit in the corner and we had a game that, you know, those chin up bars that, that, you know, I don't think they have them around anymore, but like we used to have this game called taps. So I'd be in the corner playing taps with my brother while he was doing his coaching the rest of the team. And, you know, you're around it and you're watching him and, you know, I never really uh, in those, you know, I was like sixth, seventh, eighth grade. I was like not really into wrestling. I didn't really like it. And, you know, I was a baseball guy, a football guy, played soccer. But then once I tried it in ninth grade, I realized that of all the sports that I played, that was the one that I was the best at. And it was because of my, it wasn't because I was a good wrestler. It was just because I, I hated to lose. And it wasn't that like most of the time, if you're just wrestling someone, you just, even if you don't have great technique, you're just tougher than they are. You'll, you'll win most of the time. So once I got into a little bit of a role, um, you know, then he, I would go to his clinics. So he would have these nighttime clinics over at Hofstra university for all kids on long Island. And I would, so he would coach me in those clinics, but I was going to the rival high school at the time because he was coaching at Massapequa or teaching at Massapequa when I was at Burner. So he never coached me in my high school career other than I would go to his clinics. Uh, but I was around it all the time. When you graduated from Penn State, you began to pursue another dream, competing in the Summer Olympics at Seoul, South Korea. But then, boom, your dream was shattered when you injured your arm. What happened? Can you describe how you felt? Was this the lowest point in your life? Uh, yeah, it was, I wouldn't call it the lowest point in my life, but it was definitely a downer. And it was more so because of the finality of it all, the ending of it all. Like I was still a young guy. And when I tore out my arm, it was pretty obvious that I had to get it reconstructed. And there's just like, it's again, it wasn't the type of surgeries that you have today that they are, they're is not as invasive as the, those days were. And coming back from two of them is just a non-starter. You know, I had gotten on the, uh, but I won the World of Spa. World of Spa is the 20 and under. So I was the number one ranked 20 and under wrestler, right? And, and the whole point of the World of Spa program was world aspirant. So it, you were supposed to, that was supposed to put you on the glide path to be in the top handful to compete. Like they just had the Olympic trials this weekend. That's actually at Penn State. And uh, I think they had eight out of 12 guys that were in the finals. All eight of the 12 were from Penn State. So, you know, we had, I sort of had that as my, uh, all right, this is how the next four years of my life are going to go. And then when that got like abruptly ended, yeah, there was definitely disappointment. But then it's back to, all right, well, I'm going to turn these lemons into lemonades. And, uh, you know, and that's when I decided that I, I wanted to like now start my career and I wanted to start in the sports business. Didn't know exactly how, but I, I figured out, you know, a way in and started learning about the production business and started off my career. And then the rest, as they say, is history. Do you think you wanted to stay around sports just because that's what you're familiar with? Or did you always want to end up doing something in sports even after wrestling? Yeah, I think it's probably more the latter. I mean, I was just around sports my whole life. My father was a coach and teacher, and I, I just took a liking to, I was like the the term sports fanatic, like fanaticism. Like I was just, uh, you know, I was a fan of uh, baseball was actually my favorite sport. And, uh, you know, football and, and ultimately in early on in my career, I ended up working at Major League Baseball. So I always thought of it um, not only as a passion, but also there was like real business opportunity because that's when all of television and sponsorship and the, and the real like what we know today is commercialization of sports was like in the early days. And you could just see, like I knew enough to know that it was going to be, you know, a, a, a large industry with lots of opportunity. And it was something I was, I was passionate about. I have heard you describe your parents' moral code whose cornerstone is the golden rule as the moral code you have adopted for yourself. And it's not, he who has the gold makes the rules. Ha! Huh. My synthetic voice doesn't lend itself to comedy, but I can't help myself sometimes. Anyways, I got excited when I saw your moral code 
began with treating everyone as you would wish to be treated yourself because the golden rule began with Jesus. He said that there was only one thing more important than to love your neighbor as yourself, and that was to love your God with all your heart. Are you a Christian by any chance? I ask this without any judgment because I am a disreputable Christian. And Jesus also said, judge not lest you be judged. Yes, I am a Christian, a Catholic, and um, you know that's that was mom and dad, and uh, you know I teach my own children the same thing, right? It's it's mostly. Uh, I mean, obviously, I believe it, and it's it's very very simple to easy and understand. Like there is no um, there's there's no discrepancy in that. Like. When, whenever my children, because um, it's an easy thing for your children to understand. And if you come into my house and we start talking the golden rule, because, you know, kids are kids and they'll be fighting with each other. And, but it's very easy to show them like, would, now, would you want your brother or your sister or your friend to treat you like that? Well, no. Well, okay. Well, then why are you treating them like that? Like, it's a very simple, it's just basic fairness, like do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. It's not complicated. Like if everyone did that, like, and you know, there are people in my neighborhood, we live in a, in a little cul-de-sac area and you know, they were always having this debate about, you know, kids in the school and, you know, parenting now, Tim, isn't like parenting when we were growing up, it's way different world with social media and all this craziness around us. And I always say, and this is what the, you know, my mom passed away back in September and I gave uh, her eulogy or a eulogy at the, at her wake. And I always, you know, the thing I remember about my mom and the golden rule, as I was telling the story was my, my mother was able to, in her own way, even though she was one person, she scaled love like she she was able to and that's what her that's what her secret sauce was was she was espousing love and respect for other one another and respect for you know freedom that we live and enjoy here in the greatest country in the world and you know you that go that works both ways and she so if we could ever affect us those that are closely around us, in our case, our children. And then she was able to do that not only with her own children, but then her own children did it with their friends. And then their friends did it with their friends. And they always knew Mrs. Bev was going to do like, she was able to, at the center of it, have, have love and respect, but also make it such that everybody can understand like, well, wow, like I, if, if I'm giving out love and respect, that's what I'm going to get in return. And if just more people would do that, even if it's only a few people at a time, that's the power of multiplication, right? And, and so I have great, I, I revere my mother for that and my father. And that really was their, their contribution. And that will be the gift that keeps on giving as long as I give it to my children, my children give it to their children and their friends and so on and so forth. We, we, we build it one brick at a time. That's beautiful. Did they, did that come from your grandparents or was your mom and and dad kind of the ones to start that path? The trend? You know, I'm, I'm sure it had something to do with like, I I knew my grandparents a a little, Um, they died when I was uh, probably in my early teens and, you know, so they, they, you know, remember, like, most of them were, were immigrants, right? My mother comes, you know, she's Irish, my father's Italian. So a generation before they were all coming over from, from Europe. And, you know, it was, it was a very um, familial, right? Your, your, you know, there was a lot of like extended families in those generations that lived together for long periods of time. And, you know, they were starting anew here. And, and, working their ass off at whatever the hell they were doing to try to make a couple of bucks so that they could then make uh, their children's lives better. And then, so I think for sure the DNA and the ethos of Mm -hmm. my parents and their, their upbringing were, I'm sure um, 
were influenced heavily by the way they grew up with their parents and grandparents. So, you know, like I've just tried to put my own little wrinkle on it. And, but fundamentally it's still the same. Chris, tell us how long it took you to formulate a plan for the next phase of your life, both business and family, and tell us what you did from there. Yeah. You know, on the, on the, on the business side, um, I, I always, you know, my, I, I, I very, um, specifically and intentionally decided when I got into the sports business that I wanted to learn across the whole spectrum of the business because I always in the back, even in those days in the back of my mind, I wanted to go do something on my own. I didn't even know what the hell it was. I just said, um, if I want to like do something on my own, I'm going to have to really learn something inside and out. So I started in TV production, then I got into TV programming, then I got into sales and marketing, then I got into sports marketing. And, you know, I got, and I had four or five different jobs at different employers and, you know, built relationships. And when I got uh, towards the middle of my time at Nike, so I was, I was the guy at Nike that was, I was a global negotiations director and I was a guy flying around the country, uh, going to Syracuse, Tim, uh, I think it was Jake Krauthammel at the time was the AD and, uh, you know, buying up all the, the college sports rights so that Nike could put the swoosh on all the uniforms. And, uh, I decided, okay, now's my chance. And I'm, you know, Phil Knight was basically my boss and Phil's like trying to get me to become the, he, he wanted me to take the U S sports marketing head. And I, I was like, I didn't want to move back out to Portland. And I was like, I wanted to um, convince Nike that we should start at the time a 24 hour college sports channel. And I remember having these pitch meetings with Phil and Tom Clark was the president saying, we're spending all this money in college. We get all these rights. We don't use them all. Like, why don't we go to a media partner? And Fox was who I had in mind at the time. And this is 1997, 98. And, um, you know, the sort of satellite TV and digital cable. I'm like, there's going to be a 500 channel universe. There ought to be a 24 hour college sports channel. And Nike ought to own that. And Phil was like, well, you know, we don't sell, we don't sell TV. We sell shoes and clothes. And so I was like, okay, this is my opportunity. I'm a single guy. Um, you know, I don't have any, I don't have a wife and kids. I didn't have any, you know, I, I paid off all my student loans, you know, everything I was. And I was like, I'm going to go for it. I now know enough about this world that I think I tried. So I, I resigned from Nike, flew out to the, my share house in the Hamptons, wrote together a business plan, spent the next year flying around the country, meeting with college presidents and athletic directors and commissioners. And my pitch to them was, you're in a one bidder marketplace called ESPN. And if you never create an alternative to ESPN, you'll never get the value you deserve. And they were all like, oh, this is great, Chris, but what do you want from me? I just, you know, I want you to give me a bunch of the rights that ESPN doesn't use. And I want you to support, okay, we'll do that. And so <laughs> once I had that, I had guys like Jim Delaney and Bob Bowlesby and at the time, uh, Roy Kramer was the SEC commissioner and Tom Hansen was Pac-12. And I was like, if I do, if we do, if we all do this right. Remember, this is 1999, 2000. We all do this right. Someday you're going to have your own network and someday you're going to have your own network and someday you're going to have your own network. <clears throat> but you got to start somewhere and I can do that for you. Oh, okay, great. So that's how I got into starting college sports television. Um, we then put together a, a, an investor group. We raised a hundred million dollars of private equity money. And then five years later, we sold it to CBS. It's now the CBS sports network. And that was a crazy wild time. And, you know, like it was one of those moments like, and, and there were moments along the way, right. Where to go back to the earlier story um, where, you know, when, once the big boys got wind of it all, meaning ESPN and Fox, they were trying to put us out of business. And we're, so here we are, we're like two or three years into this and we're going through everything and we're burning cash and they're trying to put us out of business. 
And I'm sitting there staring at the ceiling at three o'clock in the morning. I got 300 employees. We're down to our last like $10 million of cash. And I'm looking at the ceiling and I'm going, holy shit. And who do you think I was thinking about? Mike, <laughs> Mike Langlius. There's no freaking way I'm giving up. They're going to have to kill me on this hill. I will not stop. So, you know, it turned out right during that time, right? We, I was like, oh, like run at him. Like, so we had this, we had all this evidence of this ESPN stuff. And so we, 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 we hire these <laughs> law firm and we're like, Oh, we got good news and bad news for you. Like, oh, what's the good news? Well, the good news is like, yeah, you got a real, you got a real antitrust case against ESPN. I said, Oh, wow. And they like, well, what's the bad news? Well, he said, like, the bad news is you'll never win. I'm like, well, well, they'll just, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll be broke by the time you can. He goes, but I don't have an idea. Uh, what's the idea? He's like, I know some people down in Washington. So they set up a bunch of meetings with the FTC and the DOJ and we go and we make some presentations and they were like, wow, this, this doesn't sound right. Uh, and so sure enough, the DOJ opened up an investigation against ESPN and, uh, you know, lo and behold, when uh, the next set of rights agreements came out to the market, you know, we were able to get them, get football rights, which is really what we needed. And then we sold the business six months later because we had the football rights. So that was, uh, that was just surviving. And, and we did. And it was a great outcome. It was a wild ride. And I thought, oh, man, I don't know if I want to do that again. That was hard. Uh, but it was right at that time. Uh, to answer the second part of the question, which was, I did all that as a single man. And I always thought to myself, at some point, I'll be ready to be a father and a husband. And now I, you know, done this and, you know, gotten some, uh, gotten some wealth. And I thought now's the perfect time. And, and I, I had already started dating my wife and she had a front row seat to all the chaos there at the end. And, here we are, uh, it's almost 20 years later, and we got four beautiful children, and that's the way that part of my life worked out. I'm a, I'm a blessed man. I'm a blessed man, no doubt. When you, when you guys had that sale, I mean, you mentioned you, you got some well thought of it. I mean, it sounds like it was a pretty successful exit. At that point, why not just, you know, hang the, hang the cleats up, I guess, and get out of it? Why not retire? Is it that love of competition? Oh, yeah. I mean, plus, I was only 42, or whatever I was. Yeah. How old was I? I was like, I was still a young man. I wasn't going to like sit around and do nothing. Uh, and now I'm glad I didn't because now these four kids in five years are all going to have hundred thousand dollar a year <laughs> bills that I got to pay. Uh, God willing, going to nice schools and what have you. So sure. yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's, so here, here he is 20 years later, you know, still in it, still in it. I've also, I've read the, uh, the book shoe dog, I feel yeah. night a few yeah. times and that's, that's a like personal favorite. I actually have it on my shelf right here. Um, how much, I'm just curious cause you were so close to it in the front row seat. I mean, how much, how much would you say is the culture of Nike really like that versus the, uh, I don't know, maybe entertainment value of a book? Oh no, that the, a lot of that book, uh, you know, and I have great respect to my two, like whatever you want to call it, uh, but business idols, you know, in my career are Phil Knight and Howard Schultz, uh, the founder of Starbucks. Um, and you know, while they're definitely their own personalities and they're much different in many respects, they're also very much the same, right. In terms of how they, you know, built the culture and they built the culture that people bought, bought into, right. And, you know, they, they built a brand, right. That really, you know, Starbucks means coffee and Nike means sports and Starbucks really means community as much as it means coffee. Right. And people, and that's just something that really makes the brand unique as does, you know, Nike. It's hard to think about sports without thinking about Nike, right. They're like the biggest sports sure. brand in the world. Right. And the, 
you know, there are two entrepreneurs, right, that fought through the picks, as they say, and were not going to be denied. And we're able to do that by harnessing, you know, a, a movement and culture and reinventing it as the years go by. And, you know, you think the Nike brand is like still like the dominant brand in their ecosystem. And, you know, you could say the same thing about Starbucks, that they're, they're lasting cultures that have been built over time. And, you know, setting a vision and getting people to follow is really the secret sauce. Was there any, I'm sure there's a lot of things, but what was the, what was the best thing that you pulled from Bill Knight into your, into your company or companies? Bill Knight was, it was, you know, he talk about not getting out competed. Like this is a guy, if you read the book, right, where he lived basically check to check for 20 years out of, you know, like he started with in the trunk of his car and all the stories about going to the Japanese banks and no one would give him any money. And he was shoe leathering it together and he would barely get enough money to pay the payroll. Like that wasn't like for some two or three year period. It was like for almost 20 years until they went public in 1980. You know, he started the business in 63 or 64. And so like talk about perseverance and talk about like not giving up. Like that's the poster child. Um, yeah. you know, and, and Howard and Starbucks, you know, really not much different, right? Uh starting with a couple of, you know, small chains out in the San Francisco Bay Area and building it into a global powerhouse, like with all the ups and downs. And I mean, it's just it's just crazy that um different stories, but the ethos is very, very similar. After your big sale to CBS, you and your wife created a foundation. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, that's, uh, you know, uh, once we, we uh, sold the business and, you know, we had some liquidity, um, you know, the, it's obviously uh, important to give back. And so we, we just took, a, you know, set up a, like a foundation where we took a percentage of the of the proceeds so that, you know, we could use it to give to initiatives or causes that, you know, we we felt uh, good about and over the years, you know, w- which is what we've done. Not, you know, huge amounts of money to any one um, particular uh, initiative, but, you know, a lot of, um, it just allowed us some some freedom and flexibility to you know, to, in our own small way to participate and to give to friends that were doing things that we thought were great causes. And we're, we're super proud of that. Is that, uh, is that something that I know, obviously you you sold, like you mentioned almost 20 years ago, is that something that you've, uh, I don't know, didn't even know the right word for it. Is that still like a passion of yours, I guess, is that the foundation as much as the business stuff, or do you like more of the I guess the hunting or the competing of the business side. Yeah, definitely more, more the latter. Like, um, you know, we've kept the, you know, the foundation and we've contributed into it over the years so that we, you know, continue to have resources to, you know, to, to deploy when something, um, comes up, but no, I spent the, I figure that my number one job right now is my children. Um, my number two job is, being a great husband. And then my number three job is my hobby. And I've got a hundred children here, uh, or so to speak, uh, people that are doing great work. And, you know, we're also inspired to do what they're doing because they love what they're doing. And, you know, I want everybody to, you know, achieve what they want to achieve. Right. So just being like the enabler of all that is a high priority. So, After the CBS sale, you have a thriving consulting business and decide that your next venture is micro betting. Can you explain how and why you got into that? Yeah, I have. uh, I still have my media advisory investing business, although it's not as active as it was because uh, about, well, six years ago this month, uh, we just had our six year anniversary. I co founded this company, this technology company called Simple Bet. And we sell enterprise software technology to consumer-facing businesses, sportsbook, online sportsbooks like DraftKings and Caesars and 
Bet365, where they use our technology to do all the in-play wagering and gamification. So when you're watching a baseball game, you can wager on every pitch or every at-bat or every inning. You could wager an uh, NFL and college football, every play and every drive in basketball, every shot and every possession. So that technology that we built is super complicated to build. We've invested over $100 million to date. We've got, like I said, about 100 employees here and a lot of machine learning, engineering, data engineering, um, artificial intelligence type technology. And it's uh, not really an area I knew a lot about. I didn't know, I, I certainly know about engagement in terms of the media side of the business and any kind of interactive uh, experience like betting that drives longer watch times and more engagement of live events, right, is in this world, um, not only entertaining, but super valuable, right? Because ultimately media is driven by engagement and, and watch times. And if you have something that does that, that's really valuable. So if you didn't know that much about it, how did you get into it? Uh, I kind of stumbled into it more because my partners at the time, they were, I'm like, I'm not a gambler. I don't, I don't sports bet. Um, I never really have. And it's more, I come out of the, the more, the media side and the fan engagement side and the data side, right? So a lot of what's happening in the, in the broader me, media ecosystem, right, is we're moving from a, um, um, what used to be a mass media model, mass media meaning like you'd have one broadcast for 30 million people, right? Like, and as we, as we move away from mass media into what, what I call direct to consumer or personalized media, right? Right in the center of all that is, is data and, and all the new products that data will actually um, fuel. And one of those products, right, is, is sports wagering. So I came out of the media and the data side, right? So, you know, you, you, you understand like through what's called first party data, right? That's why Amazon, as an example, right? Oh, Amazon, they, they decided Jeff Bezos decided 25 years ago, he wanted to build an online bookstore. So remember, he started out, he built an online bookstore, and then he realized, well, I'm getting all this information and all this data from people that are coming online, and I have credit cards, and I know their age, I know where they live. Why don't I build a mall in the sky? And then all of a sudden, I don't know, a few years later, he built a mall in the sky. <laughs> and now that mall in the sky has turned into a lot of things, right? It's turned into a TV network. It's, you know, it's turned into a retail outlet. It's turned into... Um, you know, a, a pharmaceutical company and, you know, they're now getting into all kinds of other business. They turned into a, a cloud storage business. And like, you know, all of a sudden you went from an online bookstore and at the center of all this is data. And that's really how I got into what I, what, what this business now is like, it's all this stuff is, it comes out of first party access to first party data and consumer behavior. Do you have any qualms about gambling as a vice? Uh, you know, I do, um, in that I don't want to, uh, you know, I, I don't want to be in the business, so to speak of creating problem gambling as an example, like, like even if I owned, uh, you know, uh, a beverage company or a brewing company, I wouldn't want to be in the business of creating alcoholics or a tobacco company and creating cancer. Like now what I see the benefit of what we do on that front is it's, it's now a regulated industry, right? And so the more that can have people coming out of the illegal markets, because there's, there's tens of billions of dollars of illegal wagering in these offshore markets and black and gray markets, and everybody is trying to be, make it become essentially shine a light on all this, regulate it, tax it, of course, but also make it safer for the end user, right? Which is, it has all these integrity uh, issues surrounding it, especially in sports. Like there's a couple of these incidents, like the kid, the kid, the, the, the Porter kid from, from Toronto and the Shoei Otani thing with his interpreter. And like the last thing you want to happen is for 
for the integrity of the game to get um, messed with. And I think by having legal and regulated gambling and our role in that, right, because our software and our technology can detect problems way faster. Like that was the beauty of this, what happened with the NBA kid, Porter, like, like years ago, that would have gone undetected because it would have gone through the illegal markets. But now it's detectable like virtually instantly. So it actually has, it's actually the opposite, even though the, you know, the, those that are against it, right, will use this as the clay pigeon as to promote and market why it shouldn't be done. But the reality is it's happening anyway. And that's what Adam Silver did 10 years ago when he wrote his op-ed in the New York Times saying, you know what, we're now for gambling, let's legalize it and let's regulate it and shine a light on it so that we can get rid of all these nasty characters. And I think that's kind of the, the view I have of it. Chris, thank you for your time and sharing your inspirational story with us. God bless you and your family. Uh, thank you very much for that. But likewise to you, Tim, you, you are an inspiration yourself and God bless you and your family. Chris, I got to ask you one more question. <laughs> I jokingly say this every time and my dad's not, he's not t- uh, p- taking the hint. I always, I always ask people before we let them go. My dad always tries to, to, to wrap it up. But um, one of the things that was important to us is we want to talk to a, like a really wide range of people. We didn't want it to be an ALS podcast or a sports podcast or, you know, really just wanted it to be just interesting people with interesting stories. So, um, and that's how obviously we got connected, right? We, we spoke to Brian Kilmeade, who, who uh, said we should connect with you. So I'm going to ask you the same question. Who are a couple of interesting people you know that you think that we should interview on the podcast? A couple of interesting people uh, that uh, you should interview on the podcast. Um, well, I would have said, I would have immediately said Phil Knight, but he'll never do it. He hates doing public <laughs> stuff like this. Uh, I would say, uh, I mean, over the years, guys like, uh, well, he just retired. You know who would be a good one is uh, Sean McManus. You know, Sean from, he was the president of, uh, or ch- chairman of CBS Sports, just had an amazing career, and he just retired uh, last week, as a matter of fact. Um, he'd have some amazing stories, I'm sure. Um, and who else could I think of when you put me on the spot here? Um, I mean, I may have to, I, I'm, I'm sure I can think of a lot of people, but I want to think of someone who, who has a great story, but also would be willing to do something like this. There's a lot of sure, guys that, yeah. won't, that won't feel comfortable doing it. Uh, sure. Um, yeah, so he would be a good one. Um, you know what? Let me think about it, and I'll, I'll come up with a name or two. I'm sure I will. Yeah, definitely. Well, thanks so much for your time. And um, you know, like, like you said, my, my dad, you and my dad are both the two, the two grapplers on the call, so... We made it through. <laughs> we made it through the uh, you know the episode with no no uh, tables getting flipped or no no <laughs> <seconds on. laughs> no, no no four point throws exactly. Yeah. <laughs> all right, great to meet you. Thanks so much for doing this. Thanks again, Chris. First of all, this is my voice. I'm Tim Green, and I have ALS. This podcast is not about ALS or living with disabilities. I don't want you to feel sorry for me. I don't feel sorry for me. I am a father of five with a marriage that's lasted for over 33 years. I am a number one New York Times best-selling author of 41 books, an NFL first-round pick with an eight-year career. I worked on TV for Fox Sports, Good Morning America, Court TV, and Extra. I've hosted BattleBots, A Current Affair, and Find My Family. And I am also a practicing attorney. In this podcast, we're diving into real-life stories. From Triumphs to Trials, we'll explore the extraordinary in the ordinary. Join me, Tim Green, and my son, Troy, each week for real conversations, laughter, and insights. Because life is a journey, and everyone's got a story. Barkley Damon LLP is proud to be the law firm sponsor of Tim Green's podcast, Nothing Left Unsaid. For more on Barkley Damon's team of nearly 300 attorneys with regional, national, 
and global reach from our offices across the northeastern U.S., Washington, D.C., and Toronto, go to BarclayDamon.com. I want to thank my partners at Barclay Damon for supporting this podcast and, of course, Eleven Labs for their incredible technology. If you like today's episode, a free way to support the podcast is to subscribe and share it with friends. Thank you. A significant amount of these sponsorships go to TackleALS.com. For cutting-edge ALS research at Massachusetts General Hospital, if you want to make a contribution, go to TackleALS.com.